Welcome, welcome. This is According to Callus. This is episode 249. And we're going to just call it Monday Madness. I was thinking about Molotov Monday, but I figured the uh, censors might get a little bent out of shape about that and, you know, uh, shadow ban me some more. So, uh, first thing up for today, we have my friend Kyle, KD Sims, is going to be doing a uh, sit down, a little uh, open mic night on Thursday night at Redemption Point Church. Redemption Point Alliance Church, excuse me. That's in downtown McKinney. It's all over his social media. I suggest you go on over there and check it out. And he's going to have a special guest of Cambry Nelson. And they're going to talk about what's going on with the schools and what you can do about it. And my friend Kyle has asked me to stop on by. So I will hopefully get a chance to throw my two cents in. But, uh, you know, if you haven't been filing, or following uh, Kyle KD Sims on Facebook, you are missing out. You should go check it out. Um, his page is uh, Kyle KD Sims for Texas. And I imagine the majority of you know who uh, Cambry Nelson is. If not, you might want to check her out as well. I believe she is on um, Glenn Beck's network. Uh, both of those uh, folks are fairly... Uh, more well-known than I am. Uh, yeah, so Cambry Nelson is with Texas Scorecard, and then I think I think she does some stuff on the Blaze Network. So that's uh, the uh, appointment for Thursday night, the 1st at 7 p.m. at Redemption Point Alliance Church. Uh, for more information, go check him out on his social media. If you haven't been paying attention to what's been going on with the school boards, well, let me tell you, the hits keep on coming. Prosper apparently has their own problems uh, of the Hunter Biden variety, apparently. Uh, I will leave your imagination to do the rest there, but you should go check it out. They actually have a meeting tonight that was supposed to be at 7 p.m. for their school board that they've actually bumped forward to 6 p.m. Uh, I'm sure Kyle will be out there in full force with his Patriot Network, and I would strongly suggest if you get an opportunity to get out there, you should go. Uh, I'm going to actually be dropping this episode about two hours earlier than usual to get the word out. And Prosper, Texas is due north of McKinney, and honestly, a good chunk of McKinney on the north side is serviced by Prosper ISD. So in case you're following along, we have problems out in Frisco ISD, problems in McKinney ISD and now some more problems up in Prosper ISD and I gotta ask myself how does this happen well the answer the short answer and the quick answer is we haven't been paying attention we haven't been involved so while we can certainly blame the uh, administration for their lack of oversight and their lack of effort and quite frankly bad hiring habits the reality is, is it strongly falls upon us we elect these people, we put them in positions of the power and authority, and we're supposed to be able to trust them to do their jobs. But when they don't, it is our responsibility to show them the door. So if we're not willing to do that, if we're not going to stay on top of it, you know, that is the cost of liberty. If you aren't willing to be vigilant, you're going to lose it. So again, strongly recommend if you've got the time, 6 p.m. tonight at the Prosper ISD School board meeting. And now for just a brief uh, thing here. It is August the 29th. It is a Monday. And I am here. And I got to tell you, I had any number of things I could have spoke about. But I'm going to let you in on a secret. I have a guilty pleasure. The guilty pleasure is I enjoy watching left-wing political programming. That includes the West Wing, which is now off the air. And actually, for what it was, was quite the enjoyable show. Now, when they went full left-wing, it got a little hard to stomach at times. But I do it like, enjoy the way they visualize things happen behind the scenes in the Beltway. And then the next one was Madam Secretary. So my wife has been going through watching these, and I, of course, tag along because I enjoy these shows. It, again, the guilty pleasure. So in Madam Secretary, if you don't know, I want to say it was on from about 2014-ish to 2019. 
And, of course, that's during the run-up and election of the Donald. And a lot of things that happen in there are what we might call projection. We might call foreshadowing, wishful thinking. And, and look, when you're watching a left-wing political show, you're going to get their talking points. And that doesn't bother me. I'm willing to listen to an intelligent discussion. On occasion, old Martin Sheen would get in there and go on his pontificating ways because, you know, he's smarter than the rest of us, on, or at least his character is. And I forgot what his uh, president, whatever the heck his name was. But the show was pretty good, and it was entertaining most of the time. And, I mean, Rob Lowe was on there for a while. And there's, uh, oh, I can't think of the guy's name, but the guy that played his chief of staff, he's a really good actor. Uh, he showed up on another left-wing show that's about doctors, The Good Doctor. Um, again, so Madam Secretary, uh, the main character, the Secretary of State, you know, trying to get us ready for Hillary to be the next president, one would say. Um, but it's played by a very capable actress. Um, and for the life of me, <laughs> the name just escaped me. And I mean no disrespect because I, I got to say, even though it's total lefty show, it, it, it's generally enjoyable until... I guess it's season five. Season five, it goes all in on the hate of anything that's right of center. So the character's name is Elizabeth McCord. And I don't remember if she's got her doctorate or not. But of course, her father, her husband, excuse me, her husband has got apparently a number of doctorates and fighter pilot and a Marine and, you know, all these things. But, you know, his wife is going to be the president. Of course, that'll come later on. And she's working as a former CIA person that got elevated to be secretary of state uh, by the former boss of the CIA or her former boss in the CIA, who is now the president and uh, the actress is Taya Leone. I cheated. I looked it up on my phone while I was talking. And again, good program, pretty interesting. And I mean, even uh, the, Oh shoot. No, I can't think of her name. I'm going to look it up since I've got it up already. Uh, B.B. Newworth plays her chief of staff early on. And you may remember she was Fraser's wife slash ex-wife, both in Cheers and on his own show. So again, another high quality actress and, you know, good show. But boy, by season five, they decided the Chinese are not the biggest threat. The Russians are not the biggest threat, but it starts off as just nationalists in general, and then it becomes white nationalists. I think they're substituting the term white nationalist for European nationalists, but yeah, whatever. And, and the other thing is the catastrophic climate change. Now, granted, the show's been off the air for three years, and they started filming and putting this out. I want to say it was 2018, so it's been a, four, a full four years, and there's no catastrophic climate change. Not that any of us necessarily believe that in the first place, but those are the boogeymen in the show. Now, I understand it's fiction, and they ham things up, and they've got to make the show. But if you're going to try and do a reality-based show, right, something that potentially exists in our current continuum of history as we know it, it might be useful to, I don't know, try and follow the line of the world around us. But instead they project and they put their worst concerns out in the forefront as if that was reality. So very little about the show ever deals with the idea of a Islamic extremist. Oh, they have in the show. I forgot about this. They have mm, Christian fanatics or quasi Christian fanatics, which there are some, and they do some bad things. Nobody says otherwise. But in a world that we live in that is populated by the vast majority of terroristic acts being perpetrated by people that subscribe to a religion that is not Christianity, I find it ironic that they're afraid to go there. Now, in fairness, they do poke at China. They do poke at Russia. But... The worst thing that come out of Russia was their nationalist leader. And they actually brought up the fact that, you know, Hungary's got a nationalist leader. Now Poland's got a nationalist leader. 
you know, Russia is a nationalist leader and oh my God, Russia and Poland and Hungary are going to cause the apocalypse upon us because their leaders care about their countries first. And God forbid we should have the boogeyman of a nationalist American, which of course they promptly disposed of because of Russian collusion. Sound familiar? (laughs) And then of course the, the best part about it is when I, kicked over to season six, we find out she won her race for the presidency and she beat a old, white, overweight, semi-senile guy from Texas of all places. (laughs) And the way they defeated him is because he had sired illegitimate children with his interns. (laughs) It kind of sounds more like Bill Clinton than any uh, Republican in Texas, but, you know, I digress. Uh, and, and, of course, the way they found out about that is his uh, Iranian uh, people broke into his personal email and made that available. So, clearly, uh, that is... Um, Now, you know, so the first several uh, episodes have to deal with the fact that the new administration is having to deal with this so-called scandal because the other guy that was defeated had some dirt on him that was released by the Iranian government. And they think that, of course, the McCord uh, candidacy had something to do with it. And it's got this... (laughs) Some ridiculous looking Republicans grilling her people, uh, which is ironic because I don't think if I remember correctly that the Democrats were all that thrilled about her running as an independent either. But I digress. It's funny because it mirrors what was going on. The dog and pony show, for lack of better, the circus that was going on in Congress as they were investigating Trump and still are investigating Trump in the January 6th insurrection. So I got to tell you, the first four seasons were actually quite good. I mean, of course, you don't agree with it if you're right of center and you, you know, this is kind of grin and bear it when they're going off on their little tangents. But I got a couple of key takeaways here. Aside from the worst thing in the world for all of humanity is nationalists, much less white nationalists, which I think they really meant European nationalists. I'm trying to be gracious here. LON, catastrophic climate change, we're all going to die. Okay, so setting those two things aside, it did illustrate the wisdom of the forefathers and that you didn't want a president that had divided loyalty. In other words, one of his parents wasn't from a foreign country or he wasn't born in a foreign country or she in this case. And that way that played out is one of her speech writers, and I don't remember what the character's name is. It's not that important, but he had been in the whole show until season six. His character is half Pakistani and something happens. Uh, and I don't remember if it was in Pakistan or if it was in India and being that there's a large overlapping region there that they all fight over and you've got your Islamic tribalism thing going on. So he has what some would call a very emotional response to a young lady who is obviously of of a Muslim faith and they want to do an honor killing. And he thinks that the entire policy of the United States should change because of his concerns for this Islamic girl. Now, I won't get into all the details because it's largely irrelevant. The fact is, is this guy has a dual loyalty. He has the loyalty to his own country, but his own problems with the, let's call it, rural, tribal, Islamic faith as exercised. And like I said, I don't remember if it was in Afghanistan or Pakistan or, or India because it's kind of a thing that they left nondescript. Pretty sure it was Afghanistan, but again, his his character is conflicted because of that, because of his experiences. And in this case, instead of it being overly positive or overly 
um, sympathetic, it's antagonistic, right? He can't stand the fact that this is how things are done in this country. This is how things were done. And my grandmother or whatever, whatever parent is had to flee this. And because it repels me and disgusts me so much, I think we should change the entirety of the uh, policy of the United States because of that. So that was a concern. The other side of the coin, right? So you can either have too much loyalty for something or too much negative baggage against something if you have that kind of the heritage there, right? So that's one of the things the founding fathers were afraid of. And they put the certain requirements in for somebody that would serve as a president. And perhaps they should have maybe considered those that serve on the presidential staff. But of course, because Elizabeth McCord is smarter than everybody else and more even keel, she diplomatically finds the way through it. And in fairness, I don't really have a problem with what her solution was. And also fairness, it was suggested by somebody else that actually lived there. So there is something to be said for that. Okay. Second thing that I thought was very interesting and and I would take as a takeaway, they, and they got this right in my opinion. And I know, I know sometimes people left to center, get things right. And this thing is, is we don't want to escalate that sometimes it's better to walk away or sometimes it's better to de-escalate before things become a problem. And I got to say, I appreciate that. I think that's a good thing. And, and the people left of center used to be this way. They used to not want to fight over things, especially when there was no clear victory, right? And now the progressives are split on this, right? We've got our warmongering progressives and then we've got the peacenik progressives. And on the peacenik stuff, I got to say, most of the time they get it right. Maybe for different reasons or different motivations, but you got to take what you can get out of it. I mean, Ron Paul has taught this and the great Ron Paul has worked on this for decades when he was in Congress. Hey, we agree on this one thing, so we should work together to do something about this one thing. The other thing, and I don't know if I want to call this a takeaway, but she has this giant bill that she manages to jam through with the guy that she defeated in the presidential race. (laughs) Uh, The, overweight old white guy from texas who again sired children out of wedlock with his intern uh she cuts a deal with him to get the, her big monstrosity bill across and again just showing how both sides of the aisle will sell out their ethic ethics at the drop of a hat to get their name on something or to get appreciation and, and i don't think they're wrong about that either but in that it creates a gas tax And of course, they're all upset because this is a regressive tax. It punishes the poor people more than the rich people because everybody uses gas. And, you know, if you're poor, that's a bigger percentage of your income. Okay, that's all well and good. But again, when you tax somebody, no matter what the tax is, it is we the people that always end up paying it. You can tax a business, but the business turns around and raises prices on their products or their services. So you pay it. You can tax a rich person, but that rich person doesn't work for free. That rich person uh, has investments. He'll just not invest in much or she'll just demand more money to work. So that doesn't work. It is always you and I, the wee little people who are the end customers that end up paying more money. When you force people to give up a certain amount of their income or a certain amount of their investments or a certain amount of their well, I guess income is the appropriate money. It always ends up raising the prices. It always ends up costing the little guy more. And when you say, I know, I know, there's plenty of people out there that say, well, we'll just tax the rich. Well, where do you think the rich got their money from? They probably owned a business or they probably made wise investments and that company that they own made money and they're still going to have their money short of going to their house and taking away all their investments or all their property at the point of a gun You're never, ever going to get the money from the rich. Now, I take that back. The Soviets, both in Russia and in China and North Korea, were really good about doing that. And what's funny is it only made things worse in all those countries when they did that. And wouldn't you know 
the powers that be within the government ended up getting that money and that control and that quote unquote ownership by the end of the process. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And actually that is something that kind of sort of gets demonstrated in this show, but I digress. So, you know, I, I've gone in, I've explained, I got these two shows that I've enjoyed uh, to a point and you can dismiss the political tilt and just enjoy the drama and the, the horse trading as they call it in politics that's going on. But it got to a point where if it wasn't for the fact that I'm kind of really curious to see how they end the show at about episode 18 of season five, I was done. I was de-invested in the show. So I did a little investigation, uh, courtesy of Wikipedia. Why did the show end? When was it ended? Well, it seems that they had good ratings the first few seasons of about 14 million people watching. And then about season five, that jumped down to six million. Hmm. Why might that have happened? Oh, I know. We started talking about catastrophic climate change and how we're all going to die unless we turn into a socialist world. And two, all nationalists are evil and need to be stamped out. And we need this global unity and we all need to come around and sing Kubaya and give up all of our own sovereignty. I can't imagine why people would quit watching that because, you know, now clearly a nationalist is the biggest evil and should be feared more than anything else in the entire world, except for maybe catastrophic climate change. I'm sorry, but that's a lot to overcome to maintain interest in a show that admittedly is left of center. And I'll entertain it to a point, but even at that point, and if it wasn't on Netflix, where I'm already paying for it for, you know, so it's included. I wouldn't waste my time watching the last 10 episodes. I think I'm on episode three or four of season six. And I got to tell you, it's mildly interesting. They got a customer, or a customer. <laughs> they've got a character that goes by Mike B. And I got to say, truthfully, he's my favorite character. <laughs> and I don't know why, other than the fact that I think he just speaks his, speaks the truth even when it's unpleasant. Now I got to say, if I was going to choose another character, it would be the former president's chief of staff that by, I think it's episode three shows up to become the new president McCord's chief of staff. And I enjoy him because he just pushes back on everybody about everything. And his job, the way he understands it is to protect the president. And he's, especially protective of the new female president because he's more sensitive to her situation, which of course, then Elizabeth McCord's husband, the guy that does everything had to disabuse him of that because she's tougher than that. She's superwoman and she can deal with everything. Okay. That's fine. And I'm really, I'm not sold that there's this great contempt for a female president by the right of center or anyone for that matter. I know there's a, there's a, I would call them a functional minority of people that would prefer a male president, but I don't think they're immediately dismissive of a female president. We have historical examples where it's worked out fairly well. I myself, I'm ambivalent. But to have several episodes of the show just beat up on other characters because they're dismissive and they're not sure. Well, I'm sorry. I don't think you need to heap abuse on other characters because they had a slightly different opinion on the matter. Now, I could be reading it wrong. Maybe the world out there really is dismissive and you know, doesn't think a female can handle being the leader of the free world. I could be wrong. I, I haven't actually seen that in my own life, but maybe it's out there. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt on that, but to have multiple characters berate other people because they have doubts, ah, man, again, I think maybe they're projecting too much. I, I think maybe they're working too hard to push their message rather than tell a good story, but that's just me. 
And really, my closing point on this is you destroyed what what I would say was a decent show because you felt it was more important to push an agenda, push a story line than tell a story to develop characters. Indeed, I became disenchanted to the point that it was difficult to enjoy it any longer. So I referenced another show, The Good Doctor, right? So my wife and I, we like our medical shows. We'll sit down and watch them. And, you know, this goes all the way back to ER. My wife did Chicago Hope. She watches the other one that's in Seattle. Uh, I tapped out on that real early on. And, you know, so we got The Good Doctor. We had House for a while. And actually, House was all over the map, but it was always good, always entertaining uh, as far as a good storyline. And then I, the other one, uh, The Resident. The Resident's on right now. It's decent. I, again, it's kind of ran its course. I'm I'm not sure what they're going to do now that they've killed off one of the main characters and other people are gone. But, you know, they may, they may be able to resuscitate themselves like ER did. Don't know. But The Good Doctor. I tried this last season to watch it. And my gosh, just shoving the stuff in your face. It's like they hate their viewers. And that's madness. You you don't take people that have vested their time and energy to get keyed into your story and your characters just to tell them they're worthless. Tell them they're idiots. To poo all over them, for lack of a better phrase. That's just not a good way to sell your product. It's not a good way to tell the story. But they did it. And I got to tell you, I don't think I'll be watching that show anymore. And it's still on. It might be of interest. But, you know, when you tell somebody long enough, we don't want you here. You're not valuable to us. Sooner or later, they're going to take the hint. So I'm going to close out episode 249. It is August the 29th. (laughs) And until tomorrow, I will see you on the other side.